you get just a little bit more excited when you're talking shit about a band. <laughs> I swear to God, you do. It's just a little awesome. bit of like, ooh, I get to unleash. I get to unleash. <laughs> So who did the 500th episode? Were you the host? Yeah, Vivian Campbell. All right. Guitar yes. player for Def Leppard. Oh, yeah, it's neat. It's neat. Um, yeah, I've been after him for a couple of years, and I eventually got him. That's cool. Yeah. Hey, Martin. Yeah. How are you doing, Joel? Wow, Viv Campbell. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I got it. He lives He lives about 50 minutes away from me now, Martin, in Portsmouth, yeah. New Hampshire. Cool, cool. Right Very on. cool. <laughs> Excellent. Martin's favorite. Well, good, band, right? Def Leppard. good seeing you guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it in early, get the jabs in before we begin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah. I'm going to give you guys a hard time. So here we go. Martin yeah. Popoff is a Canadian music journalist, critic, and author. He's mainly known for writing about the genre of heavy metal music and is a senior editor and co founder of Brave Words and Bloody Knuckles. He's written over 85 books that both critically evaluate heavy metal and document its history. Martin recently released a trilogy on the band Rush titled Limelight, Anthem, and Driven. Those books knocked mine down the Amazon bestsellers list a few notches, so I figured I'd call him to come on the show to give him an sorry, I'd call him to come on the show to explain to me personally why he would do that to me. <laughs> to help me beat up Martin, I invited Richard Waddell. He's originally from Ireland's oldest city, Waterford, and that makes him tough. <laughs> Richard started co-hosting the Focus on Metal radio show eight years ago. And as a fan, I'm happy to say they just passed episode 500. The episode features, as we just said, a full career chat with guitarist Vivian Campbell, by the way. So my first question is to you, Martin. And I'm wondering, what do you do in all your free time? Because <laughs> 85 books <laughs> basically means you write a lot. So to preface your answer, I'm very close friends with Michael Grace. Michael wrote Poltergeist, Cool World, and I consider him a, a, a real writer. And he told me in the get-go, never write for more than four hours a day, ever. And I wonder, do you have a rule? Absolutely. I totally agree with that. I'm, I'm a morning person. I'm usually kind of working by 637 in the morning. Um, I, uh, I start to fade around noon. <laughs> I need a nap a little later. Um, so uh, all my best work. I mean, I totally agree in that whole thing. You know, when you hear those business people talk about do your A priorities first and your B priorities second. And when you, when, when your brain cells are all gone, then do the C priorities. So, you know, it's, it's not hard doing this many books when uh, it is your main, main job, because most people, uh, most people who write any books at all seem to have other gigs that they're busy doing, doing as well. So it takes them, you know, a lot more time because they're spreading it out over a lot of time. So and I, I suppose you got to write fast as well. I mean, that is a prerequisite to get a lot of books out. I actually changed my email signature thing. I was shocked. I thought I got to add this up because, you know, my mom's telling me, oh, you must be over 90 books now. eh? So I went and added them up again. And it's 108 books now. <laughs> Your mom wants to be proud. Look, she's like, What's up? it's not even 100. What did I do? What did yeah, I do? yeah. My dad gets on the ski lift with that with total strangers and and starts tell, telling them about me. So mom always kids him about that. So, but he's quit skiing now because he's eighty two and his knees are uh, his knees are gone. He just quit this year. So does mom read all your books? No, nobody reads anything. But they watch the YouTube <laughs> videos and stuff, right? I go on with Pete at Sea of Tranquility and stuff, and they watch all that and uh, and and our show that we do ourselves, the Contrarians. And uh, I don't think they've ever listened to the podcast, even though I'm up to 100, uh, 98 episodes at this point. But uh, not like Richie, of course. Richie's I was going to say Richie in, we... that, in that field. <laughs> are we are we amateur hour to you? <laughs> are you guys? No, not at all. Watching a football yeah, yeah. match right now? Are we wasting yeah, your yeah. time? <laughs> No, no, Anyways, no. that's that's the deal. I mean, it it doesn't take that long, really. I mean, when it's your full time job. You know, before you jumped on, we were chatting about um, Danny Zalisco. Zalisco. Yeah, we're yeah. gonna. I'm gonna bring him on in a bit. We're gonna chat about his book. And uh, I, I used to know the questions because he Richard read the book, <laughs> and so he knew the questions to ask. And I would know when I did these interviews if they had read it because they only ask questions about Stone Temple Pilots. And that's because it's in the second part of the book. I get to the other stuff and I know they never bought it. <laughs> they never got that book. So you can tell so quickly how far they got in the book. Yeah. 
Yeah. But um, I think it's kind. Of, I think it's kind of fun. So, what's the kookiest book you would like to write? Are you like? Are you a? Uh, are you into crochet or something that would blow us away? Where where, where Martin writes a book on? You know, Air Supply was my favorite band. It's all a lie. I mean, what, what do you got? <laughs> Bigfoot. I definitely I've been watching a lot of Bigfoot stuff lately and listening to a lot of Bigfoot podcasts and reading Bigfoot books. And uh, yeah, I, I just love that stuff. I, I love all the all the high strangeness stuff that goes on with Bigfoot with, uh, with I the love weather Bigfoot. and UFOs and people disappearing and orbs and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I watch a lot of paranormal stuff, too, and uh, and listen to a lot of paranormal stuff and read that stuff as well, which which kind of led into a really weird, weird book that I did that is the kookiest book I ever did. This uh, Flaming Telepaths, Imaginos Expanded and Specified, which is which is probably more of a paranormal book, an occult book and yeah. paranormal slash than it is a Blue Oyster Cult book. What was your first book? Should I know? Well, it was this uh, self-published uh, record reviews book called Riff Kills Man, 25 Years of Recorded Hard Rock and Heavy Metal. So it was 1,942 reviews and self-published it. And then the second book, I think, was when that got picked up by a publisher in 97. So that was 93, started Brave Words in 94, and then 97, we did, uh, we did the, uh, the official book. So that was the one with the, uh, so I, I was funny, I typed you in, you know, what comes up. So Def Leppard, it made it a big deal that you... You gave them nothing, but it's funny because I wanted to do a coffee table book at some point with like some of the, the worst lines in music history, because you'll sing the songs and you don't necessarily think about what they're saying. And the one I love with them and, and I, you know, the first tape cassette I bought was hysteria. So, but um, I, I clicked the link that, that was um, on what is the song actually about? pour some sugar <laughs> it was a broken link <laughs> and that was the first one on google <laughs> so that was funny but do you take sugar one lump or two and as a guy who's attempted to write some music i wrote a song for darius rucker um you couldn't come up with anything better than that <laughs> you know? and then you're we're in our car. song lyrics it, it never works right you get you get the newscasters on doing that in their newscaster voice sometimes you know making fun of really violent rap lyrics or something like that and, and you can make you can make any lyrics sound funny but Def Leppard is also the ones with I suppose a rock is out of the question right <laughs> you know Mar Martin I, I know you're not a fan of hysteria at all yeah but one of the things I remember listening to that record when it came out sometimes Joe Elliott would be singing something I didn't know what he was saying whatever way he phrased these words do, do you did you get that at all with Joe at all yeah, I mean, I, that's the other thing that bothers me about Def Leppard. His voice is so kind of wheezy and it sounds tired all the time. And then they load it up with the backing vocals to the point where it doesn't sound like human beings anymore. And yeah, I don't know. I, I just I, I, I hate I hate being down on him all the time, but they really are. It's it's kind of like in that same field as Brian Adams. And I don't know. It's, I, I, I just get no value out of anything they did after those first three albums. Mm hmm. Uh, Joel, you, you would have gone on the road now with a lot of bands in the 90s. Um, uh, do, you remember many, do you remember many of them loving the 80s rock at all? Or were they like... <laughs> I thought you were going to leave it right there. Pleasure? I thought you were, do you remember any of them? And the answer was going to be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it was so with Poison. So I did the Glam Slam Summer Jam. And it was uh, the one I did was Poison Warrant, uh, Quiet Riot, Enough is Enough, actually, which you guys talked about in one of your uh, things. And we had a lot of people float in and out. One of the bands was actually the Turtles, which was a, you know, one of the things I had read that, that you said in an interview recently, Martin, is you're not a big concert goer. And truth be told, I'm not either anymore. <laughs> mm. I, uh, I prefer to sit in the luxury of my and house. What, was, what were all your duties? Like, what did you do? So it kind of depends what tour. So on Poison, I was a lighting guy. And I hated lighting because the problem with lighting is you set the lights up. It doesn't mean they're going to keep working. <laughs> and I'm, I'm <laughs> like, and in a poison band, you know, at the time they were like park hands. They wanted it to be like the eighties. So the entire rig is just a bazillion of them. And I'm up there focusing them all every day. It's a good workout. And honestly for a kid, it was kind of fun. And then before the show, something's wrong and you got to climb up there. You think you're all neat. Everybody's looking at you and you're like, eh. <laughs> you know, I got it. But I think that they, that was the biggest 80s. Now, I wasn't a big 80s music list. I was a big STP fan because I had just come off the road with them. And I 
I thought they were the bee's knees. When I began to tour initially, I was very excited about the Chili Peppers. Uh, that album, Californication, was just it was so huge. It was, it was all around us. It was everywhere. STP, I knew. Uh, I had done that club where you, you get 12 CDs for the price of one, and then one of them happened to be that first album. And I had listened to it a bit, but watching it live was a different experience. And I understood the bravado of Scott. Um, when you're looking on the side of the stage and you have Ozzy repeatedly watching their entire set, hmm. something special, you know, Howard Stern, uh, always every chance to get, and you feel good. Uh, the Metallica guys, you know, they're sitting there, they would, it's an opportunity. So you feel, you, you begin to look around you like, A, I'm lucky. And B, this is something special, isn't it? Cause these guys have been around the block a few times. They don't need to watch this band. And so Scott, I think, was an amazing frontman. Yeah. And that's actually one of the things I was hoping to ask you, Martin. You know, is there is there a book on STP that might come one day? Are you a fan? What did you think of them um, as a band? I, I like them quite a bit. I don't think there would ever be a book on them. Um, I, I kind of uh, so I, I've interviewed them uh, in person, a couple of them, Eric and Dean, I guess, together that this one hotel in Toronto it was pretty neat. So I, I got to go to do that. And then I got all my stuff signed. So I've got, you know, some stuff signed by Scott as well. I remember I went to another press conference and I stumbled into the bathroom before the press conference started and Scott's standing at the mirror working on his makeup and stuff. So that was a little awkward. So, uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, other than that, I might've had a phoner or two, but essentially I, I'm too old to get enough interviews with those guys. Plus they're really hard to get interviews with. I don't know. They're kind of antisocial, the guys that are alive even, right? Um, they, they, have, they have this wall up around them. It's a little bit like, I don't know. I, I over the years, I've noticed that um, it got harder. You know, I'm saying this and I've got some six interviews coming up. But over the years, it seemed that sticks got harder to talk to. And heart has always been hard to talk to. The cult guys have always been hard to get interviews with. And I remember uh, in, in the um, in the 90s when we had Brave Words, it was funny. We it seemed like Ozzy was going to be like no problem to meet in person, to talk to, to do phoners with. And then all of a sudden it kind of stopped. And it's like, man, years are going by. We keep getting, we keep getting told about getting, or get, keep getting told no, that we can't get Ozzy anymore. Right. So you, you've got to strike when, when you can with these bands, but STP, I just feel like it's uh, it just feels, and I don't even know for sure that it's a little bit like pulling teeth, trying to ever get those guys on the phone for anything. Mm -hmm. Joel, can I ask you a question on that? Because you were on the road with him for a long, for many tours. Um, did Scott do all the interviews? So I did one tour. <laughs> but oh, one. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't know. And I wouldn't know because I'm on the stage. So when they're, the bands are gone most of the day, usually, I assume they're off doing interviews. They, they all did them, I think. And, and they're all good, too. I mean, D Dean and Rob are like musicologist dudes. They love music, right? So, um, so they Robert's love talking about it. Robert's first concert was Rush. That was mm -hmm. his first show that he went to. Uh, Dean obviously led Zeppelin just to the... I say it in my book, he would sit with you and he'll just start playing Zeppelin and then totally change it into an STP song and smile at you. You know, so... <laughs> They learn from the good stuff, um, but they're quiet guys. I think, I think, I think they would, Eric is definitely an introvert. So having him in an interview would be interesting. I would think you'd have to push pretty hard. He's just a, he, uh, he, he's a, he's just a quiet person, period. Dean's uh, kind of rock starry though, right? Dean's got some swagger to him. Dean for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Did I say Dean? I meant Eric. Yeah. Eric. Well, you really you, know, you said Eric was quiet. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, Dean, yeah. for sure. He loves being that guitar player. Um, sure. but, they you know, hated being called grunge. Eh? They just couldn't stand that. Right. That really drove them crazy. Rock, man. We're a rock band. We're a traditional rock band. It's just a few of us. And now that they were the thing, I think Scott gets a lot of clout, but as a collective whole, they were all really good musicians. Uh, they knew their craft and they, they never did sound check. It would only do a sound check if somebody, if there's a film crew or something for promotion, it wouldn't bother. They played together so many times. There was nothing really to go over. The whole big deal was like, hopefully Scott doesn't go on a bender and we finish the tour. That's always what mattered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, see what happens every day. It's like, everything good. Everything's good. Let's go. So, mm. but he was good that tour. And he, I, I never, I've heard the stories, but I never had any issues. He was very nice to me. He treated, but I'm 20. 
two years old. Wow. So I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little guy. And I mean, they were big blokes. They don't mind fighting. They're pretty tough. So they kind of took me under their wing. They would give me a hard time, give me noogies, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. They, they were good to me, but I worked hard and I cared. I, I cared a lot. So, yeah, you know, it's just Martin, awesome. what, what did you, Martin, what did you make at a talk show record? The one they did without Scott? It's pretty good. I don't remember it now, um, but it, everything they did was pretty good. Velvet Revolver is kind of underrated. I mean, Velvet Revolver fell under that audio slave sort of super group or sick of super groups thing. Right. But yeah, yeah, the talk show record was fine too. And that press conference that I saw was a velvet Re revolver press conference. And then we went down to the highway and saw them in, in Hamilton. And I had to sit down in person with uh, Duff and um, who's, who's uh, what's, what's the name of the guy, the, the, the non-famous guy in velvet. Dave revolver. Kushner. Yeah. So it was Duff and Dave. And uh, I'll never forget though. Um, sitting there interviewing them in this, you know, in this, in this ante room kind of area at, at the Hamilton hockey barn. Right. And, you know, it's, it's a carpeted place and Duff and Duff just turns to, to his left and, and just like spits on the, on the ground. It's like, Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. You know, we're having an interview here and he, we're in a carpeted room and he spits on the floor. Right. So I don't know. <laughs> okay. So here was a question I kind of jumped into it. I, I don't remember who I was talking to, but they did an interview and they were interviewing the rock star guy and he's eating dinner. And he said, the problem, he's like, you know, pass mashed potatoes while I'm doing my interview for my 15 minutes or whatever time I get. And his daughter keeps getting up from the table and she's wearing like a cut line shirt. <laughs> and it was very hard to focus on this interview. So for both of you guys, have you, have you done an interview where you're kind of like, what, the, what's going on here? You know, I, you know, <laughs> Well, um, I, I remember you know, on the food thing bothering Ricky Rocket. Uh, not Ricky. Um, uh, what, what's uh, I? I got to tell you something. So I, so I, so I was pulling out forty fives and CD singles today to come up with an episode of Contrarians, and I had some drywall stuff done in the office. So there's drywall dust, and I'm pulling this stuff and flipping through them. So my throat is kind of closed up, and my head is not working properly right now. But. Uh, Bobby, Bobby doll. So oh, right. I, I remember being backstage in the, in the, in the eating area and, and bothering Bobby doll for a couple autographs. And he was a little ticked off while he was eating sort of thing. But uh, See, so yeah, I, I remember a few of those sit downs. Get, I was told it's yeah. hard to get them on your show. Have you ever interviewed any of them, Richard? Any of poison? No, none of them. It was really hard. I'm like, I don't know why they're all super easy to talk to all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I love Ricky and Brett. And yeah. I mean, CC, uh, you know, this is one of my favorites, you know, and I they were all very personable every time we, uh, you know, got to see them. So during those tours that you were talking about, I mean, that's when we actually I, I was not a big Poison fan in the 80s at all. Um, but I but I got to when once I was charmed by them and and albums like Holly Weird and the and the extra songs on Crack a Smile and more and on Greatest Hits. That's when I, I became a Poison fan and getting to sit down and interview them and, and stuff like that. It's like, OK, well, I, I kind of like these guys, you know, and but in the 80s, I, I just I couldn't get past the productions and, and sort of the simplicity of it and very American Americana feel. So certain hair metal things kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And I never I never got on board with certain hair metal bands and loved many other ones. Mm. Worked for them on that for that greatest hits album was uh, Richie Zito produced it, and I was actually it was one of my first jobs. I was a runner for Richie, and uh, Richie was such a pain in the ass, man. He he had like a uh, you know you have to fill out the crap about getting your cell phone, and he didn't like the way he had written it how it looked, so he made me go back to like AT and T to get the piece of paper so it could look better. I'm like you're just mailing it in, so that was like my big. And then uh, it's funny that I got to work for Poison years later, but. CC's a musicologist. This dude knows his stuff, man. He really, really knows music. Yeah. And so he was, he was always really fun to chat to. I think he should do more interviews and stuff because he's an interesting guy. Hmm. He's a good I guy. I think one of the things about CC that I've heard over the years is um, he's unfiltered. He, he just says what he feels and that gets him in trouble. Yeah. A lot of people. But yeah, I would totally... Yes. <laughs> punk rocker. He's a total punk rocker, right? He's yeah. the, the DD Ramon of the band, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's a neat guy. The Ace Freely of the band. <laughs> so I have, I've got a couple albums that I love. Uh, there's probably more, but that I, I, I like to listen to every few months. Um, 
I'm a big Pink Floyd fan. I, I know Richard is. We talked about it earlier today. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but uh, I, I am. I, I think Animals is their best album. Martin had just done this book on Animal on uh, Pink Floyd. And uh, I had listened to a lot and I've, I've ended up really loving the animals or animals the most and listening to that album regularly. I feel like I hear new things every time. The other thing I was looking up is I'm like, I love Thick as a Brick and uh, I couldn't find anything you had said about Thick as a Brick. Are you a fan? Who, me? Yeah. Well, either yeah, I you. mean, yeah, I, I love I love Tull um, and Thick as a Brick is probably close to my favorite. I, I think I like Heavy Horses maybe a little more. Mm -hmm. but uh, thick as a brick's great um yeah i i mean i haven't really written much on tull anywhere but i've gotten to interview ian a few times and he's great and martin Barr. um but i've just never had any you know they do so much on their own and they talk so much and they've they've done massive you know essays in the in all their reissues and they've got their own books out and all that kind of stuff i don't think I, there's ever going to be a jethro tull book from me but uh you know what one one way i thought of getting to write about a bunch of that stuff is, is the trick of, uh, you know, I've done these uh, over the years, the t these top 500 heavy metal albums of all time. And then, yep. and then I reissued them as the top 250, blah, 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 heavy metal songs. So I, I have had it in mind uh, on the back burner to take the big poll, find out what the top prog albums are of all time from a poll and then write reviews of all of them. And that's that's one way I could get to to writing about all of these prog albums. Thick as a brick, I, I guarantee you would make the top twelve or fifteen. You know, on on a poll like that. I just love how I hear in different things on an album I've listened to so many times, and uh, I love that it's just really one track and two bits. or two bits, but it's one track. It just keeps going and going and yeah. going. <laughs> and they only did two takes which wow. I thought was really kind of neat. So are there albums recorded that, too. pardon? Beautifully recorded too for, for oh. 1972. I think it is. It's really sounds good. It is. Are there albums then that you are the same or you like to listen to, you know, often it's some. Well, you know, I, there are, there are albums that I just go back to all the time involuntarily, like clutch blast tyrant and uh, manic street preachers. Everything must go. Um, the Damned I keep playing over and over again all the time. I just constantly going back to those records, playing a lot of jam. XTC I keep playing over and over again. Um, I, you know, from, from that list, you know, I, so, so it's not a lot of, I mean, ZZ Top Rhythmine, I suppose, Tejas, but, but most of, you know, most of the stuff that maybe I'm associated with having done a book on or whatever, I'm so sick of it by now. That, yeah. that I'm I'm not I you know there's a lot of things that are that are you know can't be qualified for going back to because I'm just sick of them right <laughs> little break what well, about you Richard well my sweet spot is probably 86 to 91 because mm -hmm. I was 16 and 86 right so I always kind of go back to that era but lately what I've been finding is I'm listening to a lot of one band's catalog I'm in a big queen kick at the moment I'm listening to a lot of queen and then in a couple of weeks time, it could be Sabbath. And then, it, you know, it might be Aussie. And then I might go back and I might listen to Def Leppard or it, 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 it all depends on me really. But lately I've been like, I pick out three or four albums from a band and I'll just listen to them for like three or four days. So I do the same. I, we, I had a Pavarotti kick and we, uh, <laughs> and my girlfriend banned Pavarotti and people come over like, how could you ban Pavarotti? She's like Pavarotti day and night, a whole week. He wouldn't stop. And I'm like, uh, I like yeah. Pavarotti. <laughs> so I'm going to set you up. I'm warning you, Martin, I'm setting you up, but there, you got the warning. So this is a, this is a quote from you. I can find it on my piece of paper here. Metallica's S and M album. Note to Cayman, stick with the bland, boomer, easy listening diva stuff. Having your lame RV, army of librarians duke it out with the majesty that is, a, that is heavy metal reminds me of flabby CEOs buying designer Harleys, born to be mild. <laughs> yeah, I, I would stand by that. That all makes sense. I, I've never liked a single one of those classical things at, by anybody in any genre. I just think the whole thing is stupid. So uh, 
to me, it's about the songwriting, like writing the songs is way more important than anything. It goes on the record. After that, it's the band playing them live and way down the road in, in unutilitarianness is the band playing with a bunch of classical guys. I just don't care in, in any way. Mm. And I, I remember describing it once. I think it might even be in that review or, or because the Metallica one comes to mind but sometimes these these classical things sound like you got two radio stations competing right right when they when the signal's <laughs> going one way or another and you're hearing strings doing whatever they decided to do to be clever they're a little atonal or dissonant and counter to what the band's play it's it's all dumb i just i don't i don't like any of them mm, i have to i agree with martin because i think the only time it works with metallica is to call it Cthulhu, the instrumentals where there's space in the music. A lot of the Metallica songs like Damage Incorporated are fast. There's no room for the orchestra. You're trying to fit something in that doesn't fit. Um, and the only other songs that really worked, I think, on s and were the ones that they wrote with the orchestra in mind. The rest, I'd never listened to that album from start to finish again. I probably listened to it once and I didn't even get the second one. But I'm more, I'm more philosophically conflicted or against the idea of here's the band here's the songs here's a whole bunch of strangers playing along with them like that's the whole thing i i you know if they were playing guitars or kazoos or whatever i, I kind of have the same feeling it's just like you're a bunch of interlopers I, I don't know what you're doing here there's the songs are perfectly good the way they were now they're just worse Mm. Martin, um, how did how did you feel when Jimmy Page and Robert Plant went out then with all the African instrumental players? Again, you know, nowadays you you have to think of that a whole new way because nowadays it's called cultural appropriation, right? Mm. So nowadays it looks even more like the rich white guys, you know, slumming it with world music, right? Now it's now it's like, oh, you can't even do that, probably. You know, that's that's the weird thing about it. But but back then, uh, I, I still I still don't think it's all that great a thing. I mean, it it's good. It's good for guys to write, write absolutely brand new tunes with, mm -hmm. with whoever and collaborate and, and, and have a collaboration that's cross cultural. But there's no there's no point taking Led Zeppelin songs and bringing these guys on to to do it. So I don't know. I love, by the way. I'm, I'm one of the only people on earth who thinks walking into Clarksdale is a masterpiece. I, I, I think that is literally, I, I, people just think I'm nuts when I, you know, I rate that in the, in the list of Led Zeppelin albums and it's literally like third or fourth. I just love that thing. To me, that's the, the lost Led Zeppelin album. So yeah, loved what they did on that, that album. Mm. Mm. So what did in your, research and stuff what did michael came and do for the wall what, what was his uh, what did he lend to them i don't remember um is there a bunch of strings on there i just literally don't remember there i there's a whole amazing book where bob ezrin is interviewed to death all about the wall there's 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 a lot to know about the wall to figure out what's going on but when i did that pink floyd book you know those books were that whole series was literally find a bunch of as famous people as you can and, yeah. and or deep fans and uh, and interview them and do a QA and a on, on every studio album. So it was, it was kind of a nice thing because I, I was literally just the interviewer in, in all yeah. those books. Yeah. And okay. the top, the most amazing thing was getting Paul McCartney to talk about oh, yeah. the Queen one. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the top of the food chain right there. That that blew my mind to be able to talk to him. What did he have to say? Well, he was great. I mean, I made sure they were softball questions, um, yeah. you know, about Queen. And I think he did it because him and Brian are kind of buddies and they share, you know, animal rights, uh, you know, uh, you know, causes. Um, but um, yeah, he had some good stuff to say. And I asked him a few Beatles things as I went along, but I made sure the questions were softball questions. And, you know, with a guy like that, I said, you know, I, I just want him for 12 minutes, right? You, you come up with a number that's really short and say, you know, I can make this really short. But um, the neat thing that happened was, uh, was he, he was driving uh, his own car back from the studio, making that amazing studio. Which one was it? The one that doesn't fit your CD case. Yeah, there it is. Mem memory, uh, memory almost full. Uh, I think that was the album he was working on. I love that record. It's so good. I, I mean, all this stuff is really good. I mean, all he's very underrated. As a, I love that Egypt all those years. 
Yeah. That Egypt Station album, I listened to it a lot of times. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. But uh, so so he um so he says, "Oh, Martin, you get you got me. Uh, I'm a, I'm a captive here. I'm I'm driving my own car back from the studio, right? And which was amazing. So so I talked to him, and I actually called off the call after about 25 minutes because I, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to overstay my welcome and have him say, Martin, get off the damn phone. You know, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Right. So, so <laughs> eventually I called it off. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one of the cool things that happened as, as I could tell he, as he got closer to his home, whatever that is, um, he, he says, oh, you know, he says, oh, hang on, Martin, there's a, I'm, I'm driving up a little country lane and there's a there's a woman in front of me. He's, he's going back up, love, back up. So he's stopping for this woman who's stuck on his country lane, probably, and, and, and like to get out of the way, you know, so he's so you could hear him just driving home from the studio and getting closer and closer and more rural and more rural. And then and then there he is uh, at, at home. So, uh, no, it was it was great. And yeah, I, I kept him pretty softball. And and he, you know, his knowledge of Queen, you know, you had to keep it softball. He, he wasn't like a deep fan. He didn't know know everything. But he, he did say one thing. He had a Queen, uh, Queen, uh, a Japanese tribute band. He hired a Japanese Queen tribute band for his wife's birthday when they were in Japan. So they had Gween play for them. You should have just said, Ishmael Lachna, do it. Come on, Paul, do it, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I, I got to ask him a couple, you know, heavy metal-ish type things about Helter Skelter and stuff. And I've used those quotes in a few different books to say, hey, look, I talked to Paul. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Martin, do you know, has Brian May and Paul McCartney ever sh shared the same stage? I don't know. And I can't, I can't think of a single time that would have happened. Mm. So I don't know. They're, they're kind of some sort of animal, you know, animal rights cause thing that they did together. But no, nothing, nothing I can think of. Yeah. So here was my setup. <laughs> and I was hoping you would know better. So I got something to show you guys. But I picked this, uh, you know, I'm a memorabilia dealer. Martin and I had talked about it. I don't think I ever told you, Richard, but uh, no. so I do a lot of music and, and film memorabilia as a profession. So I have, I have this. Wow. It says the wall, but when you open it up, this is Michael Kamen's complete. Wow. This is his complete uh, handwritten sheet music Jeez. to the entire album. That's crazy. Wow. That is nice. Martin's on the next flight down to see it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, why I, that's why I texted you, Richard. Like, hey, I'm, like, I hate him. I'm like, well, this is going to be a, you're going to be a little bit down. But, yeah, I was intrigued to know. So, do you think do you think there's more in there than actually showed up on the album? Oh, this is what I'm after, right? So, there's so much written in it's hundreds of pages with coffee stains and eraser marks and all the good stuff. And I can't uh, picture a lot. Of, I I can't picture where all these strings are in in my head right now. I can read you know. through them, but I mean, there's like the wall prelude it is just pages and pages and pages and pages. It's the strings, it's the horns, it's everything. But, so, where did you get it? Where? Yeah. So I go to auctions on a regular basis. And uh, when I show up to the auction, it's not necessarily great because the people in the room, including the auctioneers, are wondering why I came. <laughs> and so I'll have people, uh, I'll ask people to bid for me. I'll pay people to bid for me or whatever. So if it's under 10 grand, there's a pretty good chance you won't see me. So they're wondering why I came and they'll start looking through everything in the rooms to see why I'm there. So if I spend too much time <laughs> looking at something, lo and behold, it's removed from the room. <laughs> Other people, they'll bid against you and then they'll uh, figure it out later. So I'll buy stuff to throw them off my scent on a regular basis. Anyway, I'm at the auction house and the auctioneer, he said to me the day prior, hey, Joel, what's this? And I thought it was a photo album. And um, we open it up and it's all sheet music. I'm like, well, you know, before computers, <laughs> you, you need to write it, you need to write it down. And, but I, I kept thinking, it says Cayman, M came in and it says Roger Waters. And I started thinking, uh, why do I know that name? And I think I knew it because I think Cayman, uh, Michael Cayman had something to do with November rain. Am I right, Martin? I, I, I might be off. I think mm -hmm. he did. Uh, and so I don't know. It was Queen's right. It was Queen's right. Yeah. Yeah. He did that. Uh, Silent lucidity. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But I, um, what do we think about that song? It's funny, actually. So to jump, I'll tell you the rest of the story, but to jump a bit, I listened to that thing with your friend where we go through the albums you like, and I'd never heard of Sabotage. I'm, I'm not a big metal listener. So I listened to it today 
<laughs> I thought it was fucking great, man. So thank you very much. Cause when that whole, the mountain King came on, I'm like, Ooh, you know, and this is now we're getting into it. And then it's just followed up by that price you pay. I'm like, this is a good album. This is very, very good. And so, um, I don't know. Thank you for, for lending me into that. But the next one that came up, cause it's Spotify, it flicks through the songs was silent. Listening to Queens, right. And I'm kind of like, well, that's a, oh, that was a drastic change. <laughs> it's kind of like, I think the album's over. I don't know. It just happened there. So it's funny how they do their algorithms and stick things together. So, so the hope is what I want to do. I had a fellow uh, come on the podcast. Who's a, an incredible, uh, his name's Kenneth Crouch. And he's one of the best piano players in the world. You know, what's funny is about a lot of the musicians you'll talk to and you'll bring on the show. They don't read music. And so they wouldn't, they wouldn't know better than, and you or I. So uh, Angelo Moore from Fishbone, I know well, and uh, I showed him he could care less. He was, you know, he was like Richard. He's like, ah, whatever. Well, I Pink Floyd. Bah. But uh, he couldn't read any. He wouldn't know what he's watching. Dizzy Reed, he wouldn't know. He didn't read music. So this guy, Kenneth, could read and he wanted to. So I'm hoping to maybe bring on some guys like that and then maybe bring on some fun guitar guys like a Steve Stevens. He's a fantastic player to start breaking down the sections but what I want to know is, yeah, I want to know that creative process. But why not? Why not get actual string people in? Because that's what it is. And just get that literally played from the book. It's like that would be really interesting to see how much of it actually matches up with the album. Right. I'm so intrigued. And then the stuff you can see the pencil marks. So a real trained person. Why did he erase this? And they'll be like, well, it correlates to this later. And he obviously switched it. But initially he was doing this and this and this. It'd be very interesting. You know, you could. So at some point I will, I'm just trying to put it together and see what to do. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big thing. I, I learned years ago from a guy named Dennis, who's a, uh, an antique dealer and a jack of all trades memorabilia dealer. He sold, he sold some incredible things and you know, what do I keep and what do I sell? And uh, he said, you sell everything. You don't have anything good enough to keep. And I'm like, like you're an asshole. You know? And years later, it's the best advice I ever got. There's only the top one. The Van Gogh is worth keeping the rest of the stuff. You don't need it. And so I sell, I sell everything. But this is my one percenter. This is neat. I happen to love Pink Floyd, too. But uh, this is my top thing that I, I haven't tried to sell. And I'm just trying to do the, the best avenue for it. And not just for me, uh, for, for everyone to, to, to see the differences of what this guy added to it. And then, you know, I'm presuming he was hired by Roger Waters. I know that he did it in New York while Roger and them were in London recording the album. So why did they hire him? Um, what happened? You know, they did the, the Pink Floyd guys. I don't know who was specifically wanted to know if I wanted to sell it. I don't right now, but um, I'm having fun with it. I think is the, is the quick answer. And so at the auction house, what happened was um, I show up, I start buying stuff. They don't know. And the item comes up and oh, actually before I preface it. So I called around the day earlier and I called my friend, Brian Cheney's. He works at Profiles in History. They're really well acclaimed as an auction house. And I said, the R in this is very similar to the R in Michael Kamen's letter I found online. And he says to me, eh, <laughs> I think it's just an R. <laughs> I don't think you're really sorry. I write to michaelcayman.com and the guy's like, that's Michael's, that's Michael. Who are you? Then you shut up <laughs> because it's not too hard to find out what auction's coming up tomorrow in LA <laughs> and you call in and you bid whatever and you ask them to pull it and you look. So I don't say anything. So I buy the item and I run up to the thing. And when you've been going for a while, you can say market delivered. So I grab it and I don't want it to go into the back. I want to take it and I want to put it. So they, they, the, the auctioneer guys looks in and they're like, fuck, you know, they're like, well, <laughs> What was that? And I'm like, this is the wall. <laughs> this is this is the this is this is it, buddy. Wow. We're just kind of like, shit. What did we just do? You know, what did we just do? And everybody's kind of looking at me, and um, it was cool. I buy a lot of posters, old posters. I sent them to Nico Lowry. I got a little plug for Nico at Swans. Nico's a really great guy. He's on the Antiques Roadshow, and the big poster is this turn of the century poster, and inside of it is a receipt, and the receipt. The person on the receipt was Michael Kamen's manager who had passed away recently. That was the chain that made it all make sense. And it's just really neat. It's just something I really, I, I take pride in. So that's why I was setting you up because it was like, what do you think about Michael Kamen? And it's like, oh. <laughs> that's wild. That's really Yeah, you're cool. the first guys that have ever seen this. I've, uh, other than sending it to the people putting the exhibit together, I've never sent photos to anybody ever. So not that you've got a very good glimpse. <laughs> it is on a Zoom call. 
But I could see a big swanky opening party with like a string quartet in the corner playing that whole book, right? It would be it would be a magical experience for a guy like me. I, I would sit there just in, in all glory. Uh, yeah. What about like a Joshua Bell? You know, just just going through the whole thing. For I mean, just it's a main, it's a neat thing to 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 talk about and to have, and maybe something a little different for you guys too. I don't know. So I thought it'd be something fun to to bring in there. Yeah, like it. Yeah. Wow. So on the on that note. <laughs> um, what albums do you dislike that everybody would expect you to like? Ooh. Well, I'm not a big Pink Floyd fan. <laughs> I, 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 I like Prague. That was pretty good. We only talked about it for 10 minutes or so. Martin, though, maybe Martin and I will get together and do something. And, uh, but I thought it was pretty funny. How could you hit? So there's no albums that you find palatable? Floyd not out. really no i've i tried animals i tried all all the early stuff i like some of the songs but as a band they just never grabbed me at all i think everyone has bands that you know they just for some reason they, they don't feel it yeah that might be ma massively popular like I, do, I don't like the doors i've never liked the doors either yeah so they're, martin's they're obviously deaf leopard band. there I, i'm uh i guess I, i'm not a big u2 fan so sorry no, I like I, some I, of their stuff. I, I um I've got I've got a good one for this answer now that it just came to me. Tool. What do we got? Tool is a band that I'm supposed to love, everybody's supposed to love. We're all supposed to respect the hell out of them. I've got all their stuff. I was semi into them at the beginning around undertow and all that kind of stuff. And then the albums got even more classic and more amazing. And you're supposed to love them to death. And I just, I would play them and I would keep trying to get into it. And I just couldn't get past the geometric wall, this of the slide rule music they were making. Right. Uh, for some reason, just couldn't, couldn't absorb those tool albums. You know, it's so, I swear you get just a little bit more excited when you're talking shit about a band. <laughs> I swear <laughs> to God you do. It's just a little awesome. bit of like, Ooh, I get to unleash. I get to unleash. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think, I think it, it's eras of bands as well, because you're expected to like a classic era of a band. Like I, I've spoken with you about this before, man, you're a bigger seventies rush fan than I am. I love, I love seventies rush, but I'm a bigger eighties fan, especially Grace Under Pressure, Power Windows, Hold Your Fire, and Presto, and, and Roll the Bones. I love it. You're more signals than before that. It, it, people can't understand. I can't believe it. Like, how can you love that era, the band, and not, and not the era that everyone else loves? It's more an era thing than a band thing for a, yeah. lot, of, a, lot, a lot of bands. Yeah. See, I'm the final cut. I'm the, I listen to the final cut more often than a lot of the big Pink Floyd albums. And then I love Roll the Bones. I, I, you know, I, I, I really enjoy um, it. All right. So Tool, I, I, I do like Tool a lot. I, I love that stuff. What, what do you got, Richard? What's your, uh, your band that you uh, should totally dislike? That I, another one. Oh, um, Radiohead. Radiohead's one for me, too. So I'm not I, a big I'm Radiohead fan. Radiohead. And see, people like they, they assume you love Radiohead because you love Tool, but no, I'm not a big Radiohead fan. Wilco, I, I know nothing about Wilco. I'm supposed to love Wilco, right? I don't like Nirvana. Hmm. I like, I, I, I love Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, never got Nirvana at all. Hmm. I love all of them. All, all the big grunge bands love them all. I did too. I did like them. I mean, Nirvana had the place for me where we just all, you know, I was big rage against the machine. I, Oh God, I loved, loved rage against the machine. <clears throat> and actually in my book, that was the time I spent was on that chapter the most. Cause I wanted to make sure <laughs> it was written in a way where it would come across great. Cause I really did. It was neat to watch them perform. I thought they were fantastic. So mm. Again, I, with Pete Pardo, and we do this thing with albums you guys do, which I, I really enjoyed. I watched a few of them, and you, you guys pair so well together. You're a great team. Um, it's my one compliment for you here today, as I've been, been beating you up maybe. But um, I, I, I had a moment where I, I started, I wanted to listen to One Hit Wonders. And I wanted to know how bad were these other songs that Dixie and the Midnight Runners <laughs> could not have a follow-up hit when they were that big. And out of it, I, I punched up a list to say the biggest one hit wonders. And it was funny because a couple of them are bands that I, I really love. One of them is Blind Melon. I'm, I'm a, I love Blind Melon. Yeah. And that's on the list. 
In fact, when I first listened to my uh, Dizzy Reed, I called him. I'm like, what the, what the hell? I was like, what, how could you not have told me how good they are? <laughs> you know, Shannon Hoon played with your damn band for crying out loud. You know, how could you never inform me that I've missed out on this great music for so long? And I, I went on a blind melon spree for weeks. But some of the other ones listed, Twisted Sister, totally don't agree with that because they had a couple big hits. I think mm-hmm. I like Twisted Sister a lot. Inagata De Vida, Iron Butterfly. Yeah. Gary Glitter. That was the one that yeah. uh, Rat is on the list, round and round. And I read, I heard there, Martin, you're a big they're not a, they're they not a one hit wonder band. You know, I, I, I love my, I thought they were the great unsung, complicated, sophisticated, awesome, smart hair metal band. Like they, yeah. like early Aerosmith, that's a band that basically always turned in a good album. They always tried super hard and everything sounded great. You know, they used to play a lot because I'm in L.A. I grew up here. And so they used to play off of Sunset all the time. And I saw them play so often and they would always give it their all. Like you said, you know, they they made an effort and they were fun. That was the thing about Poison. That's what I had to learn when I went on the road with Poison. I I was a snob. You know, I, I really did. I shaved my head every day on stage in revolt against this long hair bullshit. <laughs> and I, I turned around quickly because there was a lot of boobs. <laughs> but um yeah, you know, take your hat off. Enjoy your enjoy it. They're not trying to be Led Zeppelin. Brett's never said I'm Led Zeppelin. They're, 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 it's an enjoyable experience. So, how can you do you have the ability to do that? Just to listen to an album and, and enjoy it for what it is. Yeah. What other one hit wonders you got? This is uh, this Soul is Asylum was on there. Yeah. Which I know you're a We're fan of. Train. Yeah. Um, and then I, I know um, I think I stopped a lot of it. Then was like poppy stuff, uh, rap songs. A lot, a lot of rap songs was on there. The mm-hmm. Macarena. I'm like, you know, I figured, <laughs> I figured as a kid, you know, I, I figured these poor one hit wonder guys, they, they really wish they could have been out of this category as, as VH1 played it every single day of the one hit wonders. And you always knew it was going to be aha was the best video <laughs> and uh, Nirvana or aha was always the best video. And the one hit wonder was always Dixon and the midnight runners. But um, I don't know how bad do you think they felt about it? I think they probably did. Okay. I still, and now as an adult, I, I think it's a feather in the hat. I just I don't agree back to the you. old days, Brownsville station smoking in the boys room would fit looking glass brandy. Oh Yeah. Think of the the, the semi early oh. nascent yacht rock things like Starland Vocal Band. You know, there's a lot of fifty stuff. Yeah, a lot, a lot of fifty one hit wonders because they were churning them out. They were cruising with all these guys. So yeah, but Joel, are all those one hit wonders only in the U.S.? Because some of these That's bands might have had multiple hits in the U.K. So like Chinese Democracy, this big flop. He spent thirteen million. Blah 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 blah. It wasn't a flop, and an international level, it did well. You know, they they liked it. It didn't. It did not flop. Just you know, they, they'll say like, you know, now we're gonna beat up on America a little bit because you guys aren't from here. But actually, I was born in England, so I don't know. Hopefully, I don't get beat up when I go outside. But they'll say, you know, when I travel a lot, I'd backpack around or whatever as a kid. And uh, they say, you know, you Americans, you think America's the whole world? And I'd laugh and be like, no, no, we don't. We think the city we f- we are from is the whole world because we've never been to any of the other states either. <laughs> you know? And then they'll, they'll do these yeah. things where they'll, where they'll tell the other world, you know, where in America is this or that? And I'll be like, ask any American where Poland is. And they couldn't tell you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, was- yeah. Beat up, beat up on my country for a couple minutes there. So, yeah. That is true. That is the thing that a lot of people think about Americans. They just don't know enough about the rest of the world, right? Well, I'd be quiet. I went through Egypt and I get off the Felucca and I'm in this little village with no water. And, uh, you know, this is back in the early, in the mid nineties and there's no water, there's no electricity. And the guy comes up to me and he goes, Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton. And I'm kind of like, oh my <laughs> God, you know, where are we at? But I would use my English passport and I just would shut up. I just wouldn't talk. And then they don't know where you're from. I'd pull uh, the Stone Temple Pilots guys. And there you go. I'd be very quiet. <laughs> and then you just don't say anything. But a lot of Americans like, I'm Canadian, I'm Canadian. But Canadians don't sound like Americans. <laughs> you know, you put, the, they put the Canadian flag on your backpack and everything's good here. We're safe. So... Yeah, it's funny. I used to I used to hate the Australians because as I traveled around, actually in Egypt, they'd be like, this guy's American. This guy's American. And then I'd get shit on by everybody. So for a minute there, because of it, all my friends were Aussie. And so we'd go out drinking beers. And uh, after a while, a bunch of beers. What do you think about the Aussies? Joe? like, I hate the Australians. <laughs> I'm just surrounded by by Aussies. But a lot would happen with the Irish. I toured with the cranberries. And I mean, mm-hmm. dude, <laughs> You know, we'd get really drunk and uh, oh, yeah. that was, 
you know, you guys are into your football. You, you, you mean it so much. They'd get up all hours of the night. We, we'd do load in at like seven, eight in the morning or whatever, eight, nine, eight, nine in the morning. They'd be hammered, blitzes from the night before because they've been up all night watching. Mm -hmm. wow. So, and then, and then that's why Martin won't go to concerts because he knows. <laughs> he's, aware, he's aware they've been drinking the whole time. <laughs> yeah, no, what not, do you think about pairing? Concert. So like, uh, yeah, I like, I like Tracy Chapman a lot. And, um, and Dolores, and they did that album actually with uh, with Pavarotti. So, what do you think about pairing musicians like that? Have you found it interesting, or does it go into the same vein of uh, bringing in these artificial elements that are unnecessary? I think it all depends on the concept. Um, the person you're bringing in has to be able to pull it off. Like, if, if it sounds completely out of place, you're just going to go, ah, "It's unlistenable. I'm not going to listen to it." So, you know, I, I remember that Chieftains album, and they brought in. Um, a bunch of people and one of them was uh, Mick Jagger and they did the long mm -hmm. black veil. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Really fit. Yeah. yeah. Some mm -hmm. of them work and some of them don't. Yeah. But so you know, I, I mean, I generally have like, there's a ceiling of interest that is pretty low because I, I just, I just want to hear that band yeah. that have stuck together and have, have gone through all this. And, and I want to hear the context of those four guys and the 10 records they did before it all together. To me, to me, it's just confusing. It bothers me. And you really see it in hip hop these days, right? I mean, every single, you, you can't even read and figure out what the band name is because it's this, F E A T dot this guy and this guy produced by this guy, you know, the remix by this guy and then you, you lose the plot after a while. So <clears throat> no, I, I, you, you see that so much these days, but I, I just, I, I I'm usually not caring at all. I, I just want to see the band. Like myself and Martin are huge Kings X fans. Yeah. And all those three guys keep coming out with all these different projects and solo albums and they haven't done an album together that, been released in 10 years and it's like just doing having together a king's x record that's yeah. the other stuff is is good but there's that magic when the three of them get together and release a record so that's I'm, what uh, we want yeah i'm sisters of mercy i love the sisters of mercy so when they come out are you a fan martin no i've i've, I've tried all that goth stuff over the years. interview's over <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you know i i you know, as a as a sort of angry metalhead who is into various things as you get through the 80s and you trial these bands, them and Mission and, and Lords of the New Church, it was a little overrated for what it was. I mean, I loved having those three Lords of the New Church albums, but and, and you know, the graphics and everything looks really cool on Sisters of Mercy and Mission stuff. But, you know, you play it and it's like dancey and the production's thin and it's not heavy and you wanted it to be heavy. So so a lot of that stuff just kind of fell by the wayside. Bauhaus was always sort of casual sounding, never into the birthday party or Nick Cave. That's another one we're all supposed to love who I just I try every once in a while. And it's just like, ah, too many albums, too, too many universal music styles <laughs> he's into, right? Um, but, uh, but no, mo most of that goth stuff, I mean, I just, I wish I liked it more, but it just doesn't, doesn't come across. Uh, I love stranglers. I love the cure. Um, but, I uh, yeah, I, I just want some effort put into this stuff. I don't want EPs, you know, I don't want covers, you know, those goth guys. Yeah. They made a lot of EPs, didn't they? And a lot of live stuff. And it's like, eh. So were you this opinionated when you were a kid? Was your mom like, eat the mashed potatoes? I'm like, no, I think it was like, worse be because we we were such metalheads, right? We were just like, if it wasn't if it wasn't heavy, it didn't count for anything. And we mathematically would go through albums and call each other up and go, it's a seven out of ten, it's a seven out of nine, it's a it's a five out of six, which means it had some so sos. It actually has ten songs on it, but we had a whole formula worked out so you could just tell your buddies what an album was. Eh, it's a five out of eight. You know, with with average goods, really good, so so's, lousy goods, lousies. That that was our rating system for for everything. I mean, I, I could probably remember and spout off two hundred albums, like what they were. You know, <laughs> remember it's like so, yeah, it was it was bad. Yeah, we it was just it was a bit a little bit like that Exodus Paul Bailoff thing you hear of, right? Like you know, posers die, right? It's worse when you get a new album that comes out. You're all excited and you listen to it, and you're like, oh, and then and then you listen to it again, like. I just missed i missed something let me let me try again let me try again and then you listen to it a second time and you're like that one sounded okay let me give it again let me give it again and you're trying so hard to love it 
Yeah. But every now and then there is a breakthrough where you, you do, you're like, oh, I'm actually warming up to it and you like it. But I think I said somewhere else, this is why I think everybody in music sticks with it. It's the same idea as being that little kid and getting that album in your hand and going like, I get to listen to this again. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a fantastic feeling. It's a neat. Mm. Feeling. So a bit of fun one. You said it a few minutes ago and it's kind of like a roadie thing. How come people say that they're going to see a show rather than go to listen to a show? <laughs> and you said it when you go to see a show. Why do you think that is? Richie, take that one. Um, that's a good one. Because I always go... It's the only good one I got after that. I, so I, I always go to see it and listen. I don't think I've ever put a, a, a phone up in the air and watched it through a, a video screen. You know, the way people all put their phones up now, I, I don't think I've ever done that at any show. I always go for the whole experience. I want to see it and I want to listen to it. Um, I don't want to document it on, on a, on a three-inch screen and then put it up on YouTube. I, I'm just not a fan of that. I, I, I want the whole experience. Let's live in the moment. It's, 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 yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. I'll give you exactly. a good answer for that one. Um, uh -oh. why, why you say you go see a show? So here's here's what I would think, because obviously I've never thought of this before and it's a pretty strange question. But uh, so because <laughs> the listening to the show is competing with the record back home, which sounds way better than it's sounding here. So all of a sudden on the sound end of things, this is this is super inferior to what you always listen to, because you always have control over the bass and the treble and the volume. Uh, it sounds great in the car. Probably everybody's car is the best stereo they own, believe it or not. Right. Um, but the vision, the seeing it is absolutely as good as it can ever be, because it's not it's not fuzzy. It's not distorted. They, they're right there. The, all the lights are on. So the seeing is super, super impressive. But the listening is not very impressive, and it's already competing with something you have better at home. Yeah, right. I wouldn't argue with that. And that's why I like to listen to something and close my eyes and drink a beer or have some tea or something and just enjoy. Take it all in. When you're at a show, there's other stuff going on always. And uh, yeah. you, you know, you know, one from a roadie point of view that always bothered me is uh, is uh, we blew them off the stage or we played lousy tonight. Right. And it happens. It's the exact same answer and question and weirdness and the illogic that I think when a band, when a when a hockey team or a base basketball team says we play lousy tonight, it's like, well, okay. So when you say that, do you mean you personally played lousy, or did your whole band, by a super coincidence, all play lousy tonight? Did all five of you sound terrible tonight, and you sounded and and like? Oh, you all sound great every other night when you say we killed it. It's like, OK, so so who who's hung over here? Who's in a good mood? Who I played lousy? I, I, you know, it, it would be very. What odd. was her name and how, how, how many hours were you awake? <laughs> yeah. and, and then how did those four guys blow you four guys off the stage? And you know what? They're the support band. So they all came to see the headliner anyways. So I don't think they blew you off the stage. Uh, so yeah, all of that really, really bothers me too. Like, like that whole, that whole collective, oh, we, we played lousy. They blew us off the stage, blah, blah, blah. So the, the blow off <laughs> yeah. the stage thing. We kind of go, so I did a couple ones. So it was uh, the turtles with, with all of these metal bands. I, I have no idea who booked that, but I was so happy to see something that wasn't metal because I'd been touring with poison for a while. And the turtles were very, very good, by the way, they did a whole historical deal on, on what their band had done. And it was really fun. Um, the blue man group opening up for Godsmack. That was a bad one. <laughs> you know, what, wow. the, what the hell was the promoter thinking there? These guys made it through their show. They were the red man group by the end. They were bloody man. People threw everything they could at them. Wow. And it's Godsmack. It was mean, but then, yeah, yeah but sometimes you're kind of like, who's up? Uh, yeah. Black that, Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne. Thing. Yeah, the bill, the bills can be can be different, but uh, you know, and I mean, the and the other part of this, can you really all be better than the other guys who are all bad? Is you have songs happening over time, so it's like it's like, did they blow you off the stage with song C versus song D of your set, uh, and like? When when you went down and played something off the new album, sure, maybe the lull was, but but just like like to collectively say 
somebody blew somebody else off the stage. And and every fan out there has a total different opinion of why they're there and what's what kinds of songs they want from both of those bands. There's so many variables that that it's just it's just odd to think that that well, Martin, that was way. I think that was one of the things you addressed in when you did the Black Sabbath FAQ book. There's this wide held knowledge over the years that Van Halen blew Black Sabbath off the stage in in 78. Yeah. Yeah. And you tried to contradict that mm -hmm. um, saying that that wasn't necessarily completely true night after night after night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I, I guess thinking back, I mean, I don't know what I said at the time or or if I'm you know, who I've talked to over the years about that. But again, the logic of the situation is a little bit like Van Halen might have been more energetic every single night than Black Sabbath, but the crowd is there to see Black Sabbath. They don't even know who Van Halen is. So mm -hmm. there's a ceiling on how much they're really going to like this new band, you know, who are who are playing before their heroes. And these guys have done nothing with their lives yet. And Van Halen and, and Sabbath's now on their eighth album. So, you know, they're there to hear those Sabbath songs and those Sabbath songs get done. And, and it's not like they're falling off the stage like Aerosmith having a, a you know, a punch up and they fall off the stage or whatever. And they can't do anything. It, it, it's never going to be that bad. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe Ozzy's not singing the greatest or whatever. But but yeah, exactly. That's that's the kind of thing. It's like, no, it's it's not entirely possible that uh, that, you know, you, you all these people who paid to come see Black Sabbath suddenly they don't even like Black Sabbath anymore and Van Halen's their favorite band. Mm. I, I will say that what, there was one band that I saw in 92 and it, they opened up for Megadeth on their Countdown to Extinction tour. And I'm a huge Megadeth fan and Countdown's one of their best records. Mm -hmm. And they blew them off the stage was Pantera. Okay. Pantera just released a vulgar display of power. Wow. And yeah. I, I had, the, the album I think it was probably out about a month and they were absolutely incredible that Megadeth looked pedestrian and they were too polished where Pantera had this raw energy they were they were just uh, coming to their peak at the time they really they were hungry they wanted it and you could tell and even though they only played for 40 minutes I still put it down as one of the best sets of, of songs live I've ever seen they wow. were amazing yeah, that's cool yeah mm -hmm. you know I think it's important too for the fan yeah you're looking at the best bands in the world. It isn't like one of them sucks and one of them's good. You're you're you're, you're watching the best musicians there are. They they made it through the cut, so mm -hmm. soak it all in. And and one of the best things everybody loves about Detroit, they love music. Actually, one of the things is a uh, Toronto. So there's a place called the Warehouse. I don't know if it's still there. It was such a fun place to watch to to, to watch a show. <laughs> it was a great little venue. It was really neat, and the fans were enthusiastic. They were happy. If you had an off night or something was going on or whatever, it was okay. It was okay. Yeah. It was a fun experience. Yeah. And, you know, Richie, to your point, it's like 50 to 100 of those people thought Phil was just screaming a bunch of noise, right? I mean, bring us Dave. Dave's a great singer. Phil, this, this guy's an idiot. Look at him jump around. Oh, look at his hair or whatever. Their music is a bunch of noise. Like there's a whole lot of people hating them too at the same time, right? So that's the point. Everybody mm. in their head has got all these different factors going on. And yeah. it's just, you know, there, there really is no, no super trend to the whole thing. And the other thing that bands do that, that will turn a crowd against them is if they look like they're not having fun and they don't want to be there and they're, and they're like admonishing the crowd or they're, or they're not happy with the level of applause or they didn't, you know, they didn't sing back and they make some crack about them or whatever. There's all these, these little things that cause a lot of damage to that show that, that will turn the tide. Right. Joel, yeah. you must've seen, you must've seen that a band so, say something on stage to the crowd. Oh, yeah. So Scott was fan. What Scott would do, you know, you ever been to prison, little boy? I have. I'll make a man out of you. He would say that all the time, you know, and um, he would walk. He must have watched. This is interesting. So you're you're that good of a, a front man in, in my head. And yet you're noticing all these things with the audience. The audience, when you're on the stage, is just a big mass of stuff. It, it's very it was hard for me to like individualize people. Um Yet he would see if, if guys were groping a girl, so a girl would hop up and start cruising through the crowd. He would watch them to, if, if a guy was groping a girl who started crowd surfing, 
he would stop the show and start, you ever been to prison little, but it was always the same thing. And then if he felt like it, he would jump into the audience to go kick that guy's ass. Hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I would change the whole show. You're sitting there waiting. And then Dean and Robert don't have a problem fighting either. And they're big boys, man. So all of them, Dean, I remember, I think some guy spit at him. And he jumped in the crowd to beat the shit out of the guy. Remember, Dean was a construction worker before he started doing this. These guys are tough, dude. Hmm. And I don't know if the, if the crowds realize that, like, this guy will hit you. <laughs> So th those things would absolutely happen uh, with STP. And then Axel uh, is, is famous for getting angry and stopping the show. So uh, I didn't see that happen, but I was fearful of it in Rock and Rio. They were saying um, you know, there's 270,000 documented people there. And they were like, so we have an issue. You need to go to the helicopters and the helicopters are over there. But you're looking at 270,000 people right there, <laughs> looking at a bunch of helicopters way over there. And you're thinking like, I, I don't know. You're, you're, like Arnold here, Schwar you're like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Predator, get to the chopper. That's what I said in my book. I'm like, get to the chopper. And, and, all the, and all the security guys did not laugh at all. They just kind of looked at me. And I'm like, all right, well, it's a serious thing. But I thought about it. I'm like, I'll just throw my walkie-talkie on the floor and I'll be like with the front row, I'll be like, yeah, Guns N' Roses, we're coming after you. And nobody will know the difference. And I'll just blend. <laughs> yeah. But I thought about it for real. I did. I thought about it. Um, it is. It, you don't know what could happen. And then you have the atrocities, the things like dime bag. Um, when you realize those things can happen, but you can't live in fear either. There's a lot of things that, that, that could happen. But that one's that one was scary. I think that that was uh, it was it was brutal. So yeah. stuff, you know. So one thing, not to change the subject on poor Dimebag passing away, but Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What's your overall thought of it? Richard? Want me to go first? Sure. sure. Right. I'm from Ireland. We don't. When you get outside the U.S., Hall of Fames mean nothing. It's really an, an Amer a U.S. thing. Um, if I'm a, if I love a soccer player, I think he's a great player. If I come to America, that soccer player, they'll say, is he a great player? And then they always add in, is he a hall of famer? We don't do that outside the U S with anything really. Um, so the hall of fame actually means nothing to me. I, I don't need someone in a building in Cleveland to justify what I listen to, to say whether it's good or not. That's the way I, I, I see it. I've interviewed a few musicians and, I try to to phrase it that way to them. Like Glenn Hughes was one of them. Like Glenn is from England. Um, he didn't really take the bait. He gave the politically correct answer. Yeah, um, and you, because they have to, because uh, they have to. There's there's only a few musicians who'll come out and and say something against it. Like Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden was one of them for over the years. He's always said that he's not really interested in it. Um, and then you've got other musicians like the, the Eddie Van Halen. Um, that didn't even show up for it. Like they just didn't respond to the to getting the award at all. But to me, I'm not I'm not like say Eddie Trunk. Eddie Trunk is always rallying on about the Hall of Fame disrespecting metal. To me, it it, it doesn't mean anything to me personally. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I um I'm not a huge hater of the thing. I mean, it gives us something to talk about it, and it's it's interesting how it works. I, I suppose the one thing that I like about it is that everybody has tried to do this kind of thing so much over the years, and at least it's got some kind of traction so that um, involuntarily by osmosis, whether you argue it up or down or whatever, it actually does mean something out there in the world. Like, I mean, it does get discussed and it is kind of a bit of a hubbub when it all happens. I mean, Steve Miller really exposed the whole, the whole money flows of the yeah, whole thing yeah. and how it's just all about money kind of thing. That's too bad. But um, no, I think um, the one thing I don't like about it uh, a fair bit is this whole weird idea of Judas Priest getting nominated and then like next time they might get nominated again or, or, or it's like, well, you got nominated, you didn't get in. And now, and now, you know, you've lost your strength. It's like, to me, don't, doesn't your strength go up when you're uh, when you're nominated? Like that means, Hey, you should get in for sure next time, but no, mm -hmm. they have this kind of weird thing. Like, well, you didn't get in now you're off, you know, you're, you're off the plate or whatever. So, so that's weird. The ebb and flow of uh, being nominated and not getting in and stuff, but, and, you know, I mean, over the years, 
it, it does, you know, there is a little bunch of people and you're, and you're kind of happy for these guys getting in and not them. And you can argue about one and then next year they come up and stuff. I guess, I guess one thing, one reason I've softened a little bit on it is a, like I say, it's gotten traction and B most of the bands that I think are at the top of my list that should get in uh, kind of eventually they do get checked off and they do get in, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of happening a lot. And when people start bringing up bands that are some of my favorite bands and their favorite bands that should get in and stuff, that's when I go like, like really um, kind of like I, I say, look, talk some sense into it. I mean, they, they don't get in now. They, they might get in five years from now or 10 years from now, but even I who love this band don't think they should be in, uh, but, should but, get in now. But what's happening as well, Martin, um, these bands have been eligible for a long time and yeah guys are getting they're getting up there in age and some of them pass away and then they yeah. get in, like deep yeah Purple. that sucks yeah john lord passed away and then they got into the hall of fame so they're waiting yeah. way too long yeah to to, to, yeah. to put them in there and it, and it still has the singer songwriter Avo, uh, avocado mafia rolling stone uh, mm -hmm. bent to it right critics darling bent so there there still is that but a lot of, you know, it is pretty interesting how many of our hard rock and heavy metal heroes are are showing up, at least for nominating, and then some of them do get in. So, I mean, it's 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 not it's not it's not the Grammys. Right. It's not that kind of a travesty where I just hate the whole thing completely. Mm. And like none of it makes sense to me. Uh, the, the whole Grammy thing, nothing makes sense to me about it. But the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at least feels somewhat anchored in reality. As, as you go through this whole thing. But yeah, have it is been, weird, you know. Have you been there, Martin? To the Rockwell Hall of Fame? Yeah, yeah. a few times, yep. Because like it's it? not far from here. Yeah, it is. It's it's a really fun place to go. I mean, it is it is a little bit like uh, like a smaller version or, or more broken up into a number of things like this Pink Floyd that's coming, like the David Bowie that had happened. I love that. I went to the David Bowie thing. I was there for two and a half hours. It was a long time, right? Getting yeah. through that whole thing. There's a Rolling Stone one. Uh, Rolling Stone's coming to Canada soon. Um, so so the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, is like three or four floors of three different themes or bands like whatever for this the you know limited amount of time and they do a great job of it i saw a clash one i remember a bruce springsteen one uh and then they've got the standard stuff that's there all the time yeah it's it is it's a fun interesting thing to go to go look at and it's it's kind of neat that it is in cleveland uh because it gives cleveland something right and it's it's not yeah. far from here but it's uh yeah so cleveland became a little bit of uh you know it, it's a kind of a place we'd go once in a while you know, with Brave Words, our, our magazine put on a couple festivals in Cleveland, and I, I like the Browns. I want to see the Browns win, so it's uh, it's kind of cool. That's interesting. I mean, it, it is true that I think you'd be hard pressed to go through there and not find something you thought was neat. And for me, it was uh, John Lennon's report cards when he was a kid. Uh, Maybe silly, but I don't know for whatever reason I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, I know you're not a Doors fan. I'm actually not huge, but uh, Jim Morrison, he, he did. He excelled in English, <laughs> you know, things like that. And you're kind of like, oh, if they only knew <laughs> he wrote some good lyrics. So I think it, I think it's it's that's a good way to look at it, because my initial opinion is what you said, Richard. I don't quite understand it. If you have a, a baseball Hall of Fame or whatever, they do it off of numbers. This guy had X amount of years. He hit ERA said so. And so he deserves to be in because he's at the level that we've already established is, is great. Um, but with the music stuff, where are we uh, picking these? What hat are, are these names coming out of? And then Jay-Z is is. Is rock and roll. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's that whole thing too: pop, hip hop, country, singer songwriters, uh, legends who maybe only made a couple albums and they weren't even all that famous, but they're legends from the early days. So, so there's so many factors. You're right that that throw. So, oh, well, I have a friend. He's an Irish guy, and he is. How come Finn Lizzie's not in the damn Hall of Fame? He's like, this is just was so stupid, and he's so mad. He was mad. He was very mad. I'm like, well, because. They weren't doing a, a, a re-release of a Thin Lizzy album this year. That's why, my friend, you know, and he's like, yeah. 
Well, uh, that's one of those that that I I think like, hey, eventually, but uh, over what I'm seeing on this list, I, I they're one of my favorite bands of all time. But but I but I I like talk people down on Facebook and say, look, no, compared to this list, then Lizzie doesn't deserve to go. No. Even compared to but that. it is true. I mean, it gives you a, a way to discuss, to exploit, to dis- it, it, why you bring them up out of somewhere you haven't talked about them in a little while. It, it, it renews interest and energy. So I think that's a really good way to look at it. I like that. And I've written these articles for, uh, I did a big one on Yes. I did one on Judas Priest and I did one on Deep Purple for Goldmine Magazine about here's the reasons they should go in the Hall of Fame, right? Have you heard and of all those bands, Richard? Two of those went oh, yeah. in, right? <laughs> but Priest hasn't gone in yet. And and I think, uh, you know, what are the top of your guys' lists? Who, who are the three bands that aren't in that you think are the ones that should be in the most. Me? I'm Lizzie for sure. Who okay. Judas gonna... Priest, Iron Maiden, and yeah. Lizzie. Yeah, I... yeah, I, I'd put Priest and Maiden at the top of my list. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah. The Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Joel... Tull is not in yet, though, right? No, no. I don't. Yeah, think so I, so. I think they should be in too. Yeah, I do. I love that album. What was the so so Martin was a drummer at some point and uh, what was the name of your band uh, Martin Torque Torque okay and, and in school and in uh, in uh, second year university we had one a university band called First Inversion uh, but Torque was our main band is that is that all the band names I'd come up with yeah I think that's about it yeah we're gonna have yeah, a book on your Iron band? Maiden Iron Maiden letters <laughs> right we had a big banner behind us and all that stuff yeah that's good. Well, all right, guys. Well, uh, unless there's anything, Richard, that you're pressing to to bother Martin about here. Yeah. Well, I do have one thing to show Martin. Oh, what do we got? Oh, oh yeah, have it, Martin. Go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, you did the three Rush books. I got all three of them right here. There we go. <laughs> and they did. They drove me down the list. Thank you. <laughs> we got we got to get martin writing that book on uh, well it wasn't crochet what was it his mom's mashed potatoes or whatever and then i yeah. i'll do better again but um, i'll do a bigfoot book actually driven for the first time i saw it uh it, it showed up on the canadian nonfiction list at number nine for for sales that's the first time nice. i've ever seen a book actually on a on a sales list you know one nice. one interesting question for me maybe it's on a more personal level but um so with Danny and uh, the, there's a woman I'm going to bring on. Her name's Tana. She's do, uh, we talked about. It. She's doing a book too. So uh, she had a publishing deal. He didn't. I do not. Uh, I didn't look for one. You've you've gone through publishing deals, but you self release some. What are the major differences? What do the publishers do for you? Well, I mean, in most cases, the publishing deals are better than the self publishing. But sometimes the self publishing is better, and sometimes the self publishing is even better. Then, like if you get a real good seller, uh, sometimes they can be better than even a pretty really good, you know, publishing deal. So I've I've had I've had every size of advance from zero dollars, you know, up to I don't know, kind of kind of the ten thousand range. Um, but so so I guess the main thing the publisher does for you is if you do get a big advance, you kind of do get a bunch of pay, depend you know, like irrespective of how it sells, and you get that pay pretty quickly and. You don't have to worry about the layout and the and and all that sort of things and you, and often getting you know you have less things to do if you do it that way. But honestly, I mean, in most cases, uh, you know, across all 108 books or whatever it is, I would say the pay works out the same no matter no matter how you do it. Interesting. Um, you know, and 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 but the pay on on the self published stuff is you're printing it in like the low hundreds. But you're making twenty bucks a book. Uh, with the publisher, you're making a dollar fifty a book, right? Well, Amazon takes a lot too. They take well, yeah, and and I don't give set, I don't give any of my self published stuff to Amazon because all I hear is nightmares about how they just beat up everybody and you you don't make any money. Uh, you make no money I, on my book. I make zero, but I wanted it to be more accessible. I, I didn't really care. I didn't do it to make money. So, uh, but yeah, they they push, and then the audio book is the biggest one. They I think my audio book, we just released it. It's like 20 bucks. I mean, and there's no cost. They just email it to you. There's zero. And you're not allowed to choose the price. They set it. There's nothing you can do to decide what you want it to be. Yeah. So, but that's why Amazon's so big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Well, guys, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, it's very fun. it's good to see the two of you guys. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. That was a cool little chat and stuff. And <laughs> I feel more learned. I was intimidated by you. I'm like, I don't even know what to say to this guy. But I knew once I bought up I'm sabotage. I'm intimidated by both of you guys, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> I figure once I bring him sabotage, he'll be really nice to me. <laughs> I'll just tell him I really loved the album and he'll be like, this yeah, guy's yeah. a class act. <laughs> right on. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Till next time. Till next okay. time. Sounds right, good. Here, I'll push the end button, but we, you guys can chat. Hey, thanks for watching Party Like a Rockstar. If you're not already subscribed to the Facebook or YouTube channels, do it. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The handle is Party of Stars. Thanks for watching. You'll see you next time.